Good morning, Cherokee Hills. How are you guys feeling out there this morning? Feeling good? Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, let's get ready. We're about to worship. So let's all stand to our feet and let's worship this morning. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveils why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek the kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives. For your our joy and prize. We seek the captive's hearts release. To hurt the sick and poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's call. We are your church. Build your kingdom here Let the darkness fear Show your mighty head Heal our streets and land Let your church on fire In this nation Kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us from no more than this. Wake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with your strength and love of Christ. We are your church. The hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness be. Show your mighty head. Fill our streets and let set your church on fire in this nation. darkness fear show your mighty head fill our streets and land set your church on fire when this nation that change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray I just want to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here because we truly believe that you belong here. So whether you are joining us in person, thank you, or online, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this time of fellowship that we could be together. I pray that going into this morning, you would open our ears that we would hear, our eyes that we would see, and our hearts that we would receive your message 
that we would be able to enjoy this time of fellowship and praise and pray over those that uh, come to us this morning. Jared, with his message, thank you so much for this day and the time ahead, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Worthy 
every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like. every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Your heart and leave me in your love to go. 
as we come to our time of communion, thought, and I love our new series, uh, and the Christ-centered that we talked about last year, last week, last year, it's, it hit me. And so I asked myself, why am I here? Why do we come here? We come here every Sunday. I've been doing it so long. I don't know what else to do on a Sunday. This is where you're supposed to be, right? Because I love these people. But why? If it's just coming to get to see a bunch of friends, people all I see once a week, sometimes talk to during the week if the need arises, then why? It's because of Jesus. Because of what he did for me. What he did for you. That brings me here. That brings us here. Without that, there's no reason for me to get up every Sunday morning and get here. And spend time here. It's all a bunch of words. It's all just a bunch of songs. It means nothing without Jesus. I think C.S. Lewis said about Jesus in his book, Mere Christianity, he said this. He said, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And so all of us here, hopefully, have thought about that. And we've made our decision based on whatever evidence it was that, that, that made us say, you know what? He's not a liar. He did what he said he was going to do. He is who he said he was. And I'm making him Lord of my life. We've made that decision, so that's what we come here today for. We remember Jesus gave it all for me. And so as we take our communion, if you haven't gotten some, there's on the edge here on the tables, you can go get you a cup. And I just want you to take that time. Some quiet reflection if you need, however you need to do that. If you need to get on your knees and pray and remember what Jesus did for you. That's what we do in this time. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are Lord. And as we've just saying, you're the only one who could ever save. There's no one else that could do it. Only you. And we believe that you are who you say you are. And that you did what you say you would do. And we trust in you and in you alone. And we thank you. And it's in your name that we pray.
So what shall we say then in response to what Christ has done for us? We come now to our time of offering. And what is offering but really a response of worship? Jesus, you've done so much for me. So I will give my all for you. Everything I have is yours. It's not mine. It's yours. And I want you to have what you, I want you to have this to do what you need to do. There are so many things that we do here as a church to share God's love. We've got uh, Trunk or Treats coming up this next month. That's a nice outreach to the community to say, hey, but those things don't just happen. They take time. They take our resources. And so as we're standing and singing this next song, you have an opportunity to give to the work that's being done here. But mostly it's just saying, Lord, it's yours. Do with it as you want, as you may. Let's stand and let's sing. I am not what I make, I am who you have made me to be. I am not what I've done, I am loved unconditionally. I am not loved by the measure of love that I bring. I am not who I know, I am known by the King of all kings. and merciful giver of grace without it.
come this morning to lift your name high. We come to exalt you because you are worthy of that. God, open our eyes to see what you are telling us, to see what we need to do to further advance your kingdom, Father, to, to keep looking ahead and pursue and, and just run that race, Father. God, thank you for everything you give us because it is all yours anyway. And it's not like we can keep it after this life. God, you sustain us, you fulfill us, you give us purpose, you, you meet our needs every single day. We're still here. You are still God, you are still faithful, holy, just, righteous. And you love us. God, may we look inside ourselves and, and just See what you have in store for us today. May we every day seek out your purpose, seek your will. Know that we love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we have Children's Church. You guys are dismissed for that. This morning, I have uh, something fun to share with you all. Uh, in a lot of churches, uh, we have this, um, I don't know, the season of life that's kind of, uh, can be awkward a lot of times whenever we invest in our, our children's ministry and our youth ministry, and then they graduate from high school, and then it's kind of like, now what? And um, so today, I want to uh, share with you some good news. This is Jared and Lily Harper, and um, you've been married now for couple months yeah and so you uh, you've gotten to know them just a little bit but we've been praying about what God could do uh, for our college students and in those in that season of life and Jared and Lily have been praying about not only uh, where God's leading them and using them but then also uh, how they can be involved uh, in the church and, and serve in this way uh, next week we have our, our ministry fair that we're excited to just transform this room as we come together to worship, but also challenge you to pray about where God may be wanting to use you. And um, we are doing this here this morning for two reasons. One is because Jared and Lily are an example of, of saying, God, where do you want to use me? And feeling led to uh, serve with our college students. And so we're excited about that. But then, um, uh, just like you, we want to encourage you to be praying about God, what God's going to be doing uh, for you. So before I forget, uh, there are some brochures that are out at the Connection uh, Cafe and then out at the, our south entrance as well. Uh, but we want to tell you today that uh, starting on September the 21st, our college students are going to have a Wednesday night opportunity. For those of you that know a college student, you have one in your house, uh, and those that are in that season of life, Jared and Lily are going to be leading on uh, September the 21st, Midweek College Fellowship. And so we're excited that they've said yes to do this, and uh, so grateful uh, that they are uh, really have their hearts where they just want to pour into this group. 
And um, that's an answer to prayer for us. It's an answer to prayer for you guys. And uh, we're just so grateful. So we're going to ask that you be praying for them and our college students uh, the, and um, just praying that we could connect them. You all know that that's a key season of life, isn't it, for, for students? They're trying to find independence, you know, to be able to uh, make the faith their own. And yet at the same time, they're learning independence uh, in, in life and, and going to college and hearing all kinds of different philosophies and different approaches to life. And we're just praying that Jared and Lily would be blessed by God to um, just pour into the lives of these students. And so we're so grateful for them doing that and uh, ask that you would um, uh, be lifting them up. And so let's uh, just do that. Let's pray together and pray a blessing not only on Jared and Lily, but on our midweek college fellowship coming up in September. God, we just thank you, uh, Lord, for being um, so faithful to answer prayer, Lord, to be uh, one that has just used Jared and Lily and brought them together in a way that only you can. Lord, we're so grateful for the ways that they've uh, served and encouraged our church in the past and the way that they continue to do that, but then the ways that you're going to do that as they uh, served um, in this ministry. Uh, Lord, we're just wanting to... Um, be, be a church that loves the people that you've put um, in our lives. And uh, we just pray that we'd be faithful to do that and that you would use Jared and Lily um, to uh, just continue that for this group that's in such a um, uh, crazy time and season of their lives. Lord, we pray that you would go before them, that you would give them wisdom as they lead. Lord, that you would give them your words and that your Holy Spirit would just guide them as they do that. Lord, we pray your blessing uh, on their family and creed. And, uh, Lord, we just pray um, that you would um, bless them in a great way. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. One, yes. Thank you. One thing I meant to say, too, is that Jared works for the city of Yukon, right? And uh, so he, uh, you might see him going around um, in the neighborhoods in Yukon. And then Lily is at Santa Fe South. High school? Okay. And so Lily teaches high school English. And so um, anyway, I mean, they kind of were a shoe in for things. I mean, he, he's got a great first name and, um, you know, <laughs> high school English teachers, you know, are kind of like, that's something I'm, you know, all for as well. And so anyway, no, no, we're so glad for their heart and hope that you'll be continuing to pray for them too. Um, well, I don't know if you're a board game kind of family or person, but the game of Monopoly was derived from an old game back in 1903 in the United States called the Landlord's Game. And the land's, Landlord's Game was a way to demonstrate that an, eco an economy is uh, one that rewards individuals, one that rewards individuals is better than one where monopolies hold all the wealth. And so it was meant to kind of uh, just show you that uh, individually it's better whenever we all have and we can all um, uh, participate. Um, and then uh, they promoted also economic theories about taxation. Now the landlord's game originally had two sets of rules, one that used tax and one where the current rules are based. And so when Parker Brothers bought it in 1935, they, they first published this game with a new name, Monopoly. And the game didn't, in, in the original beginning, include the less capitalistic taxation rule. And so it resulted in this aggressive game. I don't know if you've played this with your family, but this game can still get kind of aggressive, can't it? And it's like, are you really in for several hours of this painstaking, you know, way that one person is going to get it all, right? So only one person's happy in the end. Everybody else just finally gives up, right? <laughs> like, man, this torture. I am done. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to go somewhere else. I'm hungry. And so uh, this game is named after this economic concept of monopoly, this domination of a market by a single entity, a single person, Right? that wins it all and only one person is happy. Well, this game has exploded through the years. In fact, to the point that you've probably seen a lot of strange editions of the game of Monopoly, haven't you? Well, just for a few of them, I learned this week that there is a Heinz ketchup version of Monopoly. I don't know what to think about that. There is a sun-made raisin edition of Monopoly. I think that's punishment enough. And there is a bass fishing version. There we go. Yes. They say it's off the hook. I don't know. 
Sorry. So bad. So bad. There's actually a Nintendo edition. You can see that one up there. My thought is, whose brilliant idea was that? The people that love Nintendo like video games, not board games, right? So why would you make a Nintendo version of this? There are several others. There's a 25th anniversary BlackBerry phone edition of Monopoly. I guess you can type it all in right there on your phone, and that would be great. There's a QVC version. And uh, the QVC version actually has uh, I product items. And um, I don't know if they're like $19.99, but wait, there's more, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like if you order now, you can get two boardwalk, <laughs> you know, I don't know how that works. Uh, there's a, a Golden Girls edition. Yeah. I was going to say why, but <laughs> evidently a few of you like this. <laughs> So here's, the, here's where it really escalates, is that there's a Monopoly House Divided edition. And in the House Divided edition, it, it is political, okay? If you really want to ramp up Thanksgiving this year, <laughs> bring us, okay? In the House Divided edition, it has the aim of winning states in election rather than buying properties, okay? Ooh, yeah, some of you are like, stay far away from that, okay? Do not go there. There's a cheater's edition, and uh, I don't know that you need to buy one. For Some of us just gravitate towards that. And then there's a parody edition called Socialism Edition. Socialism. Now, that's kind of the opposite, isn't it, of capitalism? Anyway, uh, we won't go there. Uh, there are a few that are just flat out mean. There is a Millennials Edition, and so my apologies to any of you for that. Uh, it is a, a um, it, it features this tagline, if you, you can't see it on the bottom of this box here, but it says, uh, forget real estate, you can't afford it anyway. <laughs> I don't know of any millennial that would want to play that game, right? They're not buying it, okay? Um, and uh, that's just flat out mean and uh, rude. So anyway, players, I guess, in that one collect experiences rather than property. And, and I guess something I read said it includes avocados, vegan food, and meditation retreats. So I don't know. That's just, I don't mean to alienate anybody here today. There is a, another one called Bibleopoly. And um, I kind of have a problem with this one because the, um, instead of going to Joe, you go to meditation. And I'm just like, that just seems kind of wrong, doesn't it? And um, anyway, there's all kinds of different versions of this. And for all of us, we kind of get into these things and then we become a whole nother person, right? Um, you, you probably have experienced this as well, where maybe in your family, you go to play a board game together and it just sometimes brings out the best in others and other times it brings out a monster, right? And this competitive nature that comes out. And the game Monopoly itself, I mean, the name suggests it, suggests it. monos, mean, meaning one, right? There's only one that's going to come out in the end. There's only one winner that gets the exclusive uh, selling and buying of everything, the control, the possession of it all. And so we see that even in a board game, it just represents this idea of building an empire and we've seen that so many times in our world, this world domination, building an empire for ourselves. We see it in day-to-day -day life, but we've seen it throughout history as well in military campaigns. We see uh, big leaders who have tried to uh, dominate the world, build this empire for themselves, have a monopoly on everything. And throughout history, you'll see some like Alexander the Great or even Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, Hitler or Stalin. Well, in Jesus' day, there was, there's plenty of that too, and maybe their world domination was their world. It may have been smaller than some of the, um, just, uh, some of, some of the um, just goals of some of these other leaders, the ambitions. But in their day, some of these great leaders had also paved the way that I mentioned before to the Romans of Jesus' day and Hellenizing, as they would say, letting all the other cultures take on their ways. And so they would try to get every society to follow their rules, to follow their way of life, and to become more and more like them. But even inside of what we would call today the church and the religious world, there were those who would try to build an empire. And we think about those in the religious leaders of the day, whether it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the teachers of the law, they would, they would create this world in which they could be the ones in control, right? They could be the ones who would have the say. They would be the ones... Uh, who everyone would listen to. And isn't that building an empire as well? 
Isn't that building a world in which you can be in control, building your own kingdom? Well, I don't know that we're a whole lot different. We build worlds ourselves, and you may say, I'm not an ambitious person. You may say, you know what, I'm happy with my small house and my humble means, but the truth is, is that we still build our worlds for ourselves in a way that suits us, don't we? We still build a world for ourselves where we can be in charge of at least what I can be in charge of. I want to be able to call the own, my own shots in my life where I'm comfortable, where I can do what I want to do. And let me ask you, is that not a kingdom? And so often we build our own kingdoms. Well, whenever it comes to Christ, our declaration, whenever we're buried into the waters of baptism, is that Jesus is our Savior, but that He's also our Lord. And whenever we think about that truth, this idea of Him being our Lord is just not just being our Savior, not just our shepherd, but our King, our King, the one who's calling the shots in our life, not us, but one who is greater. And so whenever we think about that truth, we talked about the kingdom psalms uh, a few weeks ago, the royal psalms, as we would say. And this week, we are looking at our series, This Is Us. And who are we as a church? Who are we whenever we are called to be God's people? Well, we want to be Christ-centered. We talked about that last week. But today, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Because we want to be kingdom builders in this church. And yet, there's a whole lot to that that we need to unpack today. Again, last week, Jesus Center, now kingdom building. There's this phrase in the Bible called uh, the kingdom of God. And it's used in a lot of different ways throughout Scripture. In fact, 70 times in the New Testament, and uh, 30 of those times are from the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew changes the wording just a little bit. You can understand why his audience has a certain um, just uh, extra baggage that comes with the name of God that, that was meant to be reverent. And so in his uh, audience, he called it the kingdom of heaven. And they were one in the same, the same central theme in Jesus' ministry and his teaching was this kingdom of heaven. So I want to tell you just a few things about this kingdom of heaven today. Today, as we think about uh, the kingdom of heaven, I want to remind you that it is God's kingdom. This kingdom of heaven is God's, and if we were to define the kingdom of heaven, we recognize it, and maybe you've read it this way, as the dynamic rule or reign of God. This rule or reign of God in which God is the king. He is the one that's in charge, and it's dynamic. It's not static. It changes, and God continues to change and continues to rule. The thing that doesn't change is the fact that he is king. And as we think about that reality, it's one that is partially seen in this world, but it's not just in this world. It's in heaven. It's not of heaven, um, or it's not just in heaven, but it's of heaven, and it's from heaven. And so we see that whenever Pilate was asking Jesus a few questions and trying to figure out what to do with this man, Jesus, then he asked this question of him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' reply, you might remember, is that he says, uh, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? And, and Pilate said, am I a Jew? <laughs> he said, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me, what what is it you have done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. In other words, if my kingdom were the same as all the other kingdoms, we would respond in the same way that all the other kingdoms do. But no, this is a different kind of kingdom. And he goes on and he says, but now my kingdom is from another place. And Pilate said, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say I'm a king, but in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate dismissed him saying, well, what is truth anyway, right? The point was made, though, is that Jesus' kingdom was one that was going to be totally different from any of the kingdoms of this world. And we recognize that in this kingdom, there's parallel realities that are happening. That there is this kingdom of heaven that is far above anything that we can know fully but we can just understand parts of it in this world because right now we, we have a different reality that we have to deal with. And one day, that'll, that'll change, won't it? One day we look forward to that parallel reality being made one. But in the meantime, we recognize this kingdom in faith. 
Donald uh, Craybill suggests that a kingdom, in a literal sense, refers to a king's authority over a group of people. And so it is God's kingdom, and it appears whenever people submit their lives to his will, whenever we submit our lives to God. And by submitting, we give up our right to call the shots. We recognize his authority, and we pray prayers like, Your will be done, God, because you are king. Now, I read something that pushed back a little bit on the title. I, uh, as we were looking at this series and thinking about who we are as a church, we th- used that phrase, kingdom building. And this week, I, I found some pushback on that phrase. And Dan Reed basically said it this way. He said, where exactly do we get the idea that we should be kingdom, we should be building God's kingdom? He said, we may witness to it, testify to it, plant signs of work of, of it, Uh, or work or build for the kingdom but it's God's kingdom and consequently God is the one who's building it as in thy kingdom come thy will be done and he said the best idea that he could come up with is that um, it was just mistaken speech that we've heard so often that we repeat it he says that if the kingdom is the dynamic reign of God which is how we defined it just a minute ago then how can we build it actually it should come as a relief to realize that you and I aren't in the business of building God's kingdom well it's like good news. <laughs> and basically, if you get what he's saying here, he's, he's going on to say that Christian service shouldn't be um, a sign of us building God's kingdom, but that um, we recognize that God is the one that builds his kingdom. Kind of like that song we sang to start this service, build your kingdom here. God, you do the building. And so I have to acknowledge to you today that as we think about being a church that builds God's kingdom, um, then we have to recognize that it's his we have to recognize that whatever part we have to play in it ultimately it's his thing it's it's going to succeed based on him not on us and so whatever part we play we consider it grace ciy that are we send our students to a lot of times they started using a phrase a few years ago called kingdom workers and maybe we like that a little bit better god you have allowed me to work in your kingdom You want me to um, do whatever it is, recognizing that you are king and I'm just a servant. Lord, would you build your kingdom? More than anything, we want something bigger than us. Do you remember Israel in 1 Samuel? We went through that this summer on Wednesday nights. Um, We recognize that uh, like Israel, we want something bigger. We want to be a part of something great. And as we think about that, whether we recognize it as us building it or him, we participate. We recognize his kingdom, we submit to it, we participate, and it's by the grace of God that we see it and anticipate it in our world. But it's his kingdom, make no mistake. The second thing that we realize whenever we think about this kingdom of heaven is that the kingdom of heaven is Christ-centered. We talked about that last week. And so whenever I think about it being Christ-centered, I want to look at Luke chapter 4. And I just want you to read this as maybe with fresh eyes again. And picture this moment. Jesus went to Nazareth. Now remember, this is where he grew up, right? So he goes to that hometown where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, to the church, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. (laughs) Now picture that. Here, Jesus, take Isaiah. You can figure out something to do with this, right? (laughs) And he being God, (laughs) did know what to do with it. He unrolled it, and he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. What a mic drop moment we would call that, right? He says, listen, Isaiah, hundreds of years before, he's talking about me. (laughs) Wow. I bet you could have heard a pin drop. It was all pointing to him. We talked about that last week. It all points to Jesus. Jesus taught himself as God's messianic agent for the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of God is here because I am. 
Now, if we think about that truth, the kingdom of heaven is God's kingdom. It is Christ-centered, but it's already but not yet. And as we think about that, if Jesus brought on the kingdom, then we want to know exactly what does the kingdom look like, what is it like. And I want to put several scriptures together to let you know that it is already, the kingdom of heaven is already, but it's also not yet. And it's this tension that we have as we read about it in the New Testament. And in Mark chapter 4, verses 15, 14 and 15, it was this time when John the Baptist was put in prison. Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news about God. And the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And so with Jesus coming, he said, the kingdom of of heaven is near. The kingdom of God is near. If you skip to Luke chapter 17... Uh, He is speaking to uh, the Pharisees whenever they asked him about this kingdom of God and asking when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus' response was this. He says, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Remember, it's a heavenly reality. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. (laughs) Again, what? The kingdom of God is in your midst? Well, yeah, it was him. It was Jesus. So no wonder it was there. What he was saying is the kingdom is here. The kingdom is in me, Jesus is saying. And so in Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 28, we see uh, this idea of, uh, of all these people that were coming to Jesus basically saying that he was driving out demons. And so if he was able to drive out demons, then he must be doing that through the power of some, something else. And they were saying that it was Satan. And Jesus was saying, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> if I were doing this through the power of Satan, then why would I drive out demons? Wouldn't I do something else? He said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, right? It will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And so he's basically saying, Satan doesn't drive out Satan. So how can this kingdom stand? And he says that if I drive out demons, who am I driving them out by? Whose power? He said, you be the judge. Verse 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then... The kingdom of God has come upon you. (laughs) The power of God is here. Jesus ushered in his kingdom. But I want to remind you that it will be brought to its fullness upon his return. Whenever we say that the kingdom of God is already but not yet, what we are saying is this, is that the kingdom of God came in Jesus. But it hasn't been brought to its fullness quite yet. And we look forward to that day, don't we? As Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 13, he reminded everyone that, um, that there were going to be just a few that were saved, that it wasn't for everybody because not everybody would respond. Not everybody would accept this difficult message. And so he gave the language to say that this was this narrow road. You've probably heard that several times. In Luke chapter 13, he talks about that narrow road. He talks about the idea that some will be offered this great um, salvation, but not everyone would accept it. And so this narrow door, as he says in verse 24, he says some will try to enter it, but they won't be able to. And he says in verse 29, people will come from the east and the west and north and south, and they'll take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are those who are, who, who are last will be first, and the first who will be last. In other words, this kingdom of God is something that we look forward to, and it's this feast. I've been reading um, this autobiography of a guy named Mark Stewart, and some of you would remember a Christian rock band several years ago called Audio Adrenaline. They actually are from the Christian churches. They went to Kentucky uh, Christian College, and they had a song that was a huge hit called Big House. Do you remember that one? It was Big House, and um, what, a, what a beauty. We're going to talk about that later in the series, but this truth is, is that we long for the day when God will call us for this great feast because one day it will all be made right. And the kingdom of God that was here in Jesus will be brought to its fullness someday. And we're reminded that every tear will be wiped from every eye. God will bring us into his presence and make everything right again. And we look forward to that day. What a day it will be. And so whenever we see Jesus teaching us how to pray, we're able to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, God. Because we know that you are here. But we know that one day you're going to make it all right. And in the meantime, I just want to be with you. I just want your will to be done. I want your plan to be my plan because I know that your ways are higher than my ways. God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. One day, the parallel realities will be brought together as one. 
and we will all be in his presence. The scriptures tell us in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. That he's king. And one day everybody will be singing that in unison. This kingdom is already, but it's not yet. The uh, fourth thing that we see of the kingdom of heaven is that it's an upside down kingdom. This is what we're talking about on Wednesday nights uh, in my class uh, at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. We're talking about it being an upside down kingdom. And the point is this, is that this kingdom of God, it's already and not yet, but it's completely opposite. It's radical in the changes that were made, and it's not like any other kingdom of this world. Everything that has, seems to have value in this world is just turned on its head in the kingdom of God. He sees things differently from a different perspective, and so we recognize that God's ways are higher than our ways. In Luke chapter 1, we see Mary, and a lot of times we think about these times in December, and so for me to use Luke, Luke chapter 1 and Mary's song seems a little bit out of season today, but it's a little bit cooler, so give it to me, all right, today? Let's go ahead and talk Christmas here. Mary, she shares in this magnificent cat this song of praise to God that God would use her in such a way. And what she's really alluding to is this idea that the kingdom of God was coming. She didn't know exactly what it was going to look like yet, but it was involving her baby boy. And so she sings this song, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. In other words, God sees me. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then get this, verse 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. Do you see how this kingdom is going to be totally turned on its head? It's an upside-down kingdom because we see that those who are proud are going to be scattered. Those uh, who, who rule and have thrones will be brought down. Those who are humble, they will be lifted up. Those who are hungry will be filled, and those who are rich will be empty. And so, in other words, if you have all the comforts of this world here, be careful. The kingdom of God says that it's all going to be different. Things are going to be made right and just again because this world is full of corruption and brokenness and Sometimes life's tough, isn't it? God knows what you're going through. He's going to make it right. And if he does it now, praise him like Mary did. And if he doesn't, hang on. He will. It is his kingdom. Jesus, I want to go back to Luke chapter 4. He applies the prophecy of Isaiah 61 to himself. And in a similar way of this upside-down kingdom, he describes that whenever he speaks of himself there in the synagogue. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We're going to talk about this a whole lot more on our Wednesday night class, but I want you just to be able to see that uh, God sees those who get missed. He recognizes those who seem to be forgotten. God makes things right, either now or in eternity. God's kingdom is not like any of this world. His values are different. He is just. He is good. He is loving. He is strong. He is a great God. The last thing that we see in the kingdom of heaven is that it's not just God's kingdom, and it's, it is Christ-centered. It is a kingdom that is already but not yet and it's an upside-down kingdom, but it's always advancing. Do you remember the uh, definition that I gave you at the very beginning was that it was a dynamic rule of God? In other words, it's one that can adapt and change based on uh, all the other circumstances that come and that God's rule doesn't change. But through all of that, it's, it's not static. It's always becoming, it's always spreading, it's always growing. Now, the hard part that we see with this is that we don't always feel like it is. Sometimes it feels like the church is losing doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like we're losing ground and that the enemy is winning, and, and yet I want to remind you that all the time lives are being won to the Lord, that people are coming to him, and sometimes we see it here in our context, and other times he's doing something somewhere else, but let me tell you, God is always doing something. He is always at work, 
And so we're reminded that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says this to his followers. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And he was telling them that they didn't know yet, but Pentecost. <laughs> You're going to see an outpouring of the Spirit and God's presence and power like you have not seen it before. And he says that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we see this promise that was made um, true. And the testimony of what God had done through Jesus was about to go worldwide. I want to remind you of the context of that. The idea that Jesus' followers had, had seen a lot of things take place that they weren't ready for. They were hiding, hiding out. They had seen their leader not only be arrested, but to be put on trial and eventually hung on a cross. And they weren't sure exactly what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, he's alive. And what do we do with that? Well, Jesus told him, he said, well, you go and, and w- wait until, until I tell you. And whenever I tell you, then uh, you'll get your instructions from there. It was as if what he, that, that's what he was saying. And so uh, what started at Pentecost with this flash, it gained momentum. And it snowballed into a global movement. Now what I want to tell you is that the early church, it took off. And it just continued to roll, and it continued to grow. And we are here today in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Why? Because God poured out his spirit, and he advanced his kingdom to a point that today we can stand together in unity and pray about the cornerstone, Jesus. I mean, how amazing is that? That we would be able to come together in unity and to be able to love each other and and pray for each other and to be able to live lives of faith together. Why? Because God did an amazing thing in advancing his kingdom. They had momentum. It reminds me, I had a, a friend in high school who used to tell me about um, a little girl who, uh, um, was her name was Susie, and he said that little Susie was driving down a steep hill when all, all of a sudden her, her brakes went out. And at first she panicked, and, and then she just laughed. She knew there was a stop sign at the bottom of the hill. So, I just wanted to see if you were paying attention, honestly, okay? You guys have been doing well. I've been really coming, <laughs> coming at you heavy with the kingdom of God and maybe just to exhale for a second. God was doing something big, and he's always doing something big. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and it says in Scripture that 3,000 people came to the Lord They spoke with great boldness, and what started with 120 people and one big task took off. They did what Jesus told them. They they began began to add to their number. They studied and fellowshiped and prayed together, taking care of each other's needs in the early church. And what Acts 2.47 says is that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so the story began. And it took off, and people's lives were changed. And the good news of Jesus was preached and more people's lives were changed and the Lord kept adding to their number, giving momentum to the great movement of the body of Christ. Just steamrolling through, uh, starting with Jerusalem, this message of Jesus and people were jumping on board to every turn. I want to come back and preach this some other time, but do you remember what Gamaliel said, this religious leader at the time? He said, well, you want to know if it's from God or not? He said, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you won't be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. Does anybody else just kind of chuckle at that? If it's from human origin, it'll die, just like everything else. But if it's from God, you can't stop it. Let me tell you, church, God's kingdom is unstoppable. 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 And so we look at Gamaliel's words just foreshadowing what was going to happen. Evil plans sometimes succeed, but listen, if it's from God, you won't be able to stop it. They were in the middle of proving that the church of Jesus Christ is this unstoppable force that won't die because their Savior lives. They were in the middle of proving that the church was an unstoppable force in the first century. Uh, Erwin McManus says this, they rewrote history. It radically impacted their culture. The church was the forerunner, not the runner-up, and out of the church's influence came the greatest art, the greatest music, the greatest thinkers. If you look back at the history of even things like hospitals, they came because the church cared about their communities. If you look at the greatest places of education and universities, why did they come? They came because the church wanted to educate the people. And let me tell you, the movement that started with the kingdom of God 
was something that started with 120 people in this big task, but 2,000 years later, it's led to over one-seventh of the world bowing their knee to Christ. And the Lord's still adding to their number daily those who are being saved. It's not perfect, is it? Because we're not perfect. Sometimes the church drops the ball on opportunities to steer the world to Christ, but God moves despite that, doesn't he? Despite persecution around the world, God continues to move. He can't be stopped by persecution or our clumsiness or our laziness. God continues to advance his kingdom. And maybe in that way, it is God that's doing the building, and we don't really see how he could use us. But God, through his Holy Spirit, was moving, and although they made the religious leaders of the day angry, they couldn't stop them. And so this is God's story, and it continues today. And let me tell you, church, he's got plans to use you as he builds the kingdom. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in specific ways next week, but this worldwide movement, this worldwide mission is still going on in our own Jerusalem, in our own Judea and Samaria, and so in our church, Cherokee Hills Christian Church, but then the big capital C church, we want to be about telling people the good news of Jesus so that the Lord can add to their number daily those who are being saved by the powerful message of Jesus. That's what we need to be about. We want to be about discipleship and knowing that the great commission that Jesus left for his disciples stands for us today too. Why? Because the promise stands for us today too. And that as we share our lives with other people, they would see Jesus. And that as we follow the example of Jesus, others can follow our example and in turn follow Jesus. We want to be a church that continues to advance the kingdom in any means that God would give us. We want to be a church that, that not only encourages each other, but one that makes a difference in our community, one that makes a difference in our city, one that makes a difference worldwide. I want to remind you today that there's a lot of great things that this church does to advance the gospel, and some of them we see and some of them we don't. You might come in here every Sunday morning and not really pay attention to the things that are around you, but over here on this side of our auditorium, there's a couple of maps and if you go over there and explore that a little bit more, you'll see a little bit about some of the missions that our church supports all around the world where we want to see the kingdom advance. We want to partner with what God is doing in these places. We've got a group of people here in this church that are a part of that missions committee, and maybe you want to be a part of uh, helping with missions, and you can look into that next week, right, <laughs> in our missions fair. And we want to say, say that God is doing big things, and Lord, how will you use us to be a part of it? I want to tell you that Cherokee Hills Christian Church gives 10% of our weekly giving. Every week, whenever you give your offering, 10% of it's going to these places for God to advance the kingdom. But in addition to that, every year we have that annual Great Commission offering. This idea that we could be able to give above and beyond just the 10% to do other things. And so we want to support local, national, and worldwide missions. But whenever we do that, giving 10%, it's like the church is giving their tithe, right? To the work of the kingdom all around the world. I was talking to Noni a little bit about this week, and she said, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but the very first checks that are written every week after the money's been counted, the very first check goes to missions first one she said the very last check that's written goes to payroll <laughs> and she saw no <laughs> said something's got to change no I actually I didn't say that <laughs> that's the way it should be right that's the way it should be and so through our missions commitments and our weekly giving which sometimes fluctuates right because maybe our income fluctuates it's a tricky balance and yet the commitment is made why because we want to see the kingdom grow we want to be a part of something that's bigger than us because we know that God is so much bigger than what we see and what we experience. Listen, God is doing good things here. He's doing great things here, but he's so much bigger. And he's doing so much more. And in the book that I was telling you that I was reading before, it was just a reminder that long before I came, God was moving. And long after I'm gone, he'll still be moving. He's bigger. He's greater. He is good. So here's how I want to finish today. I want to just give you a couple things that come to my mind about how do we cultivate a kingdom mindset. Maybe the building of the kingdom is just a, a phrase that we use so that we could uh, recognize that God is moving. But God, how can I be a part of it? 
How can I change my mindset to the things of this world, to this other plane, this other reality that's going on here, and be um, kingdom-focused? Well, I'll start kind of where I left off in the last point, is just that we could decide to give our first fruits, what we would call it, and tithe. Maybe that's been something that you've been doing for a long time, and maybe it's not. And you would say that, you know what, today, God, I want to represent your kingdom in giving the very first of what I have to you every week. And I think God honors that. He's going to use that in your life. He's going to pr- provide for you, but at the same time, he's going to see that this is just your act of worship, saying, God, you are number one, and I want to represent that in the thing that sometimes can be the dearest to me is my finances. I want to encourage you to give above and beyond for opportunities that are near your heart. Many of you have decided that you're going to give a tithe of your money to the church, but then you've decided, too, that I want to support a kid in another country. Or maybe I want to give to a certain mission that just really is close to my heart. I remember a boy named Eduardo years ago that just tugged at our heart. He said, you know what, we, we want to be a part of this young man's life. We go above and beyond. You might be able to give some of your time in ministry, and next week in our missions fair, we're going to challenge you to think about that truth. But I want to challenge you also to to develop a kingdom mindset by investing in someone, even whenever you know that there's really nothing in it for you. That'll challenge you to be able to say, you know what, this is not about my kingdom, it's about something bigger. And whenever you do that, I'm reminded that sometimes you'll hear people say that everyone needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy in their life. And they say that because we all need a mentor like Paul. We all need an encourager like Barnabas. But we also need somebody that we pour into like Paul did for Timothy. My encouragement to you is who are you pouring into? That will help you develop a kingdom mindset bigger than just what I'm doing. I want to encourage you to build and cultivate a kingdom mindset by pushing others into the spotlight. It can be such a temptation try to get everybody to like us or to pay attention to what we're doing but i want to challenge you to have the humility to push other people into the spotlight in this kingdom mindset and then pray for god's kingdom to come yield to his will every day and pray what i would call an open-handed prayer that you wouldn't be saying god this is what i want this is what i think i need but you'd say god your will be done truly you lead i will follow you call the shots i will obey God, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I want to be yours. And so hold plans loosely. Keep your eyes and ears open for God's leading through the Holy Spirit. And these are just a few ways that you can develop a kingdom mindset. More than anything, say, God, I want you to be king in everything. Today, as we do that, I told you last week that... um, as we make Jesus the center of everything, that one of the commitments we're going to make is to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to, to come, and if you've never made Jesus the Lord or the King of your life, then do that today. What are you waiting for? <laughs> As Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch said, here's water. What prevents you from being baptized? Let's do this. Don't wait. But maybe you want to be a part of a church that says, we want to be a part of what God's doing. It doesn't mean we get it every time. It doesn't mean we understand it all the time, what God's doing, but we want God's will to be done. You can be a part of this church. We're so glad to have had people join us recently just to say, this is my family. Make it your family today. We're going to sing a song here in a minute. We invite you to come and pray, to join the church, to come to be baptized, but let Jesus be king today. It's his kingdom. It's his kingdom. And we're just blessed to be a part of it, aren't we? God, We ask today that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come on earth as it already is in heaven, where Jesus sits at your right hand. Lord, we ask that today we would be a church that recognizes your presence, that we recognize your rule and reign, and that even from a personal standpoint, God, that we would be yielding to your um, every move. God, have your way in us. Lord, we want to be your people. We want to be your church. We want to be a part of what you're doing in this kingdom. But remind us that you're bigger. You're stronger. You're greater. Lord, we worship you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This past week, I saw a couple posts in regard to uh, Queen Elizabeth's passing. Don't you hate fact fact checking? (laughs) You know, like sometimes we'll hear or see something that sounds really good and then we'll check up on it to see if it's actually true and you go oh man it would have been so great (laughs) 
There's a quote that's been going around this week. You may have seen it about Queen Elizabeth and something that she had said about her crown. And I, I looked it up and it wasn't true of her, but actually of Queen Victoria. It may have been something that Queen Elizabeth agreed with, but actually Billy Graham talks about this. And at a ceremony in D.C. in uh, 2001, De December the 6th, Billy Graham received this honorary knighthood from uh, Sir Christopher Meyer, the British ambassador to the U.S., but it was on behalf of Queen Elizabeth. And so this foreign office spokeswoman said that, uh, that Graham is being honored for his huge and truly in international contribution to civic and religious life over 60 years. And in the excerpt of Billy Graham's address, he speaks about how great of an honor this was, and he gives all the glory to God, as you would expect him to. And he says this, I especially want to ask you, sir, uh, as they asked him, uh, to convey to Her Majesty the Queen my deepest gratitude for the high honor she has graciously bestowed upon me this evening. He said, I accept it with humility and unworthiness, and I take it as a symbol of the common historical ties that have bound our two nations together in war and in peace. And as Graham got this knighthood from England, then they also gave him this medal. And as touched as he was by that, he, he went on to say this. I read a quote that appeared in the Daily News in 1903 about Queen Victoria. And after hearing the dean preach a sermon about Christ's return to earth, Queen Victoria said, Oh, how I wish that the Lord might come during my lifetime. And when the dean asked her why, she replied, I should like to lay my crown at his feet. And that's the way Graham said, I feel tonight about any honors that may come to me. I'd like to lay it at his feet and plan to do it someday. And at my age, that won't be too long, he said. In the same way, I want to give glory, all of it to God, and all the praise for all that he's accomplished in my life and those in my family and associates that are here tonight. I, too, look forward to the day when I can see Jesus face to face and lay at his feet any honor I've received because he deserves it all. Do you agree with that? May your kingdom come. May your will be done. And God, anything that I've earned or gained in this world, may it be for your glory so I can set it at your feet and worship the one who is worthy. Would you stand? And as we sing that truth, would you lay it all down at the foot of Jesus? Yeah. 
interested in doing so, the Travelers is heading to Marlow Mercantile this Friday. They're leaving here at 945, so be sure to give them a head count by signing up over here in the Connection Cafe. Also coming up, and I know you guys are going, it's only September, why are we rushing October? Well, if Hobby Lobby could do it, so can we. <laughs> right? Out here in the foyer, and I love this bucket, it says let's do this, because yes, we have like a dozen plus of these buckets that need to be filled with candy, individually wrapped for our trunk or treat ministry and outreach to the community. This is a really big deal. Not only do we need candy, we also need you guys to sign up to provide a trunk because what's the point of trunk or treat if there's all treats and no trunk? Yeah. All right, so bring candy, sign up for a trunk. Yes. All right, and then finally, last but not least, next Sunday, whether you are young or young at heart, we would love you to be a part of our ministry fair. I tried to bring a brochure up here with me, but you guys are so excited about it. Apparently you've taken all of them, so thank you. <laughs> um, ministry fair right here, and it is going to be emphasis on the fair atmosphere, I am told. We are going to be complete with corn dogs and popcorn and all kinds of goodies. We're excited, we hope you are too, and again, when I say young or young at heart, please know that you are not too young or too young at heart to serve. I'll point out one of my, our young ones serving today in the booth on the camera. Take a look back there and give Miss Michaela a wave, because if she can do it, so can you. All right, that being said, Travelers, Marlowe Mercantile, Candy, Trunks, we need you, and Ministry Fair. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Have a great week.